detail really has been sculpted. It's like sitting in a light bulb almost. It's a roller coaster ride, fabulous. It fits me like an old glove. We've driven close to the 200 mile an hour at times. The ultimate sort of plaything. Don't ask me how much it costs. <laughs>
The ideal thing was to get into something that would take you onto the autostrada, which had no speed restrictions. You'd get up to 120, 130, 140 and stay there until you got to your destination. And, and it was practical and not probably, in business terms, excessively expensive. I first became involved because I, I, I was the proprietor at that time of a, of a magazine, a magazine called Car. We were all dreamers at heart. And so we used to, to, to deal in dreams. And it was only later that I began to feel, well, it would be nice to have some memento of those days. Um, and I heard about this car, which was a particularly well-looked-after example. And um, I thought, well, why not? The rounded corners and the, the, the quite well-shaped plan form and the careful teardrop shaping of the, of the, of the glass house are, are very much back in fashion. So you look at it and you think, when was that made? And then, of course, you realise it's 30-odd years old. The seats are large and generous and hold you quite nicely. And you can see in all directions. It's like sitting in a light bulb almost. So it's, it's a lively, um, civilised, a very nicely balanced car, which is fun to drive. I mean, I find it fits me like an old glove, and I love getting into it. And um, just setting off on a journey in, in the full knowledge, I'll enjoy every mile still. But you may well wonder how, how Lamborghini moved so quickly from this very modest concept to, to something as extravagant as that of the Mura. And I think the answer is that it was almost accidental. I think the extrovert character of his um, team, the, their youth and enthusiasm, led them to produce this concept as a chassis, which was shown first just as a chassis, um, as something that would attract attention simply at motor shows. It was a, an exhibit, a one-off. And they were absolutely astonished to find that people were not only intrigued by it and, and um, dying to know whether it would be produced, but were actually producing checkbooks and placing orders. This car is a Lamborghini Miura P400S. And this came out in 1965 and everyone thought he was going to race cars. But in fact he then got Bertone to clothe it in this rather sort of extravagant shape. And it still came out as a one-off. And he gave it to the Prince Rainier to drive at the Monaco Grand Prix. And of course all the millionaires turned up and said, we want one too. What then happened, he turned around to his factory, having taken healthy deposits from all these millionaires who were desperate to have one because it looked so outrageous and different, that he turned around to his factory and said, start making them. And Bob Wallace, the man who was in his early 20s, along with three others, had, was forced to start making them. And he turned around to Lamborghini and said, but we haven't really sorted this car out yet. It's really a bit early. But they ended up making 760 of them. And I think the first buyers were the guinea pigs because the cars were troublesome. You've got to remember it's 30 years old. To put an engine in the middle of the car, which so many manufacturers have done since, uh, was quite new at that time. To just design an extravagant body like this, I think it was the first of the real supercars, which have culminated in Ferrari F40s and McLaren F1s. But this was the first. But one of the main problems with this car is that they all caught fire. And indeed, this very car had, had caught fire. The millionaires who could afford to buy them proudly turned the key, flooded the carburetors just behind your ear, and many of them actually caught fire. These were over £10,000. It was a lot of money in those days. I think the Twiggies and Rod Stewart's of this world who could afford to buy cars like this, they found them troublesome, they let them down, and I think they soon passed them on for better things. I think what he'd done is accidentally hit upon a completely new category of owner. And in some ways that was unfortunate, because it's meant that in this country, it was a, it was a market that had very little loyalty. If you made money as a pop star, then your first instinct was to buy the most extrovert car you could get your hands on. And from that moment on, that car was always a Lamborghini. The owners were more and more people who just drove them to be looked at. Every detail really has been sculpted. I mean, you've only got to look at the sort of vent on the front and the sort of grills like that for the petrol. You've got to look at the eyelashes around the headlights that actually pop up. They're styling 
uh, details that I think everyone recognises on this car in particular, and the scoops at the side on the doors for going, letting air into the engine, and the slats over the back, which of course is a desperate way to stop the engine getting too hot. I mean, the, the early occupants fried in these cars, and they had to find a way to let all that heat out. And of course, the, to cap it all, they painted them all in these lurid colours. Bright orange, the first ones, l lemon green and lemon yellows, really outstanding colours, which just added to the sort of 60s swinging era. Everything is stiff. The steering is stiff. The gear change is ponderously stiff because don't forget the lever goes through the engine to get to the gearbox at the back, so that's very stiff. The brakes are stiff, the accelerator is stiff, you can't see out of it, especially at the back with those levers. You could say, why bother at all? But take this out on a long run, try and find an open road, hope the car's all working, put your foot down and it really comes alive. And there is nothing like this car. It is totally exhilarating, totally outrageous, Total nonsense, really, but total fun. When Ferrari and Porsche started marketing their cars, they obviously had a very low budget. When Lamborghini in the mid-60s started, he was determined to produce a supercar. He had the full budget of his tractor factory behind him in order to produce this car, but interestingly, it marketed it rather more as if it was a tractor. So you don't get the car photographed in exotic locations. You get it photographed on country lanes, on dusty roads. The shots that you get in the brochures tend to be very mechanical, very technical, and in that sense, the kind of thing you imagine was featured in his tractor brochures. The reason for the ball motive on, on the bonnet badge and for all the insignia around the car is very, very simple because Signor Lamborghini, whose birth sign was Taurus. This also actually became part of the policy in naming some of the cars with ball-related names, such as the Mura, which was a fighting bull. As the Mura was actually coming to the end of its production and being very much the supercar of the 60s, Lamborghini's engineers were already working and had designed the next supercar for the 70s called the Countach. The Lamborghini for the 70s was the Countach. This was first shown in Geneva 1971. In 1978, the factory revised the model and called it the LP400S, and the whole car was beefed up as such and became a much more aggressive looking car. This, this in turn, came to be the Countach that, that, that most people now recognise today and is probably the poster that was on more bedroom walls of schoolboys than, than any other poster that I'd like to think of. Initially, with the Countach, they were obviously producing an out-and-out -out supercar and were marketing it as such. However, the early material was not very lavish because it was intended to be cheap enough to be given away to the countless number of schoolboys who would appear at motor shows and who would write off to the factory. And in fact, one pack is already separated into different photographs so that children could stick them straight on their walls. The story is Batoni came down to sort of check this design out and they rolled it out of the garage and he said Kuntash, which is an expletive for my god, what the hell is this? It's 1988 Lamborghini Kuntash, 5000 Quattro Valvo. It's the pre-anniversary model, so it's really considered by a lot of people to be the ultimate Kuntash, the most powerful engine. It's 455 brake horsepower, V12. Well, factory guaranteed top speed, 183 miles an hour, although us owners have seen more out of it. We feel it's probably more like 190, 195 miles an hour. You know, in an age as well where most cars are becoming easier to drive, it's not so much fun, it's boring. This, this is a little harder to drive, but, um, and, and to drive well, it's, it's a little harder, but you, you get more rewards, you know, you have to put yourself into the car to really, uh, to really get the most out of it. 
Unfortunately, you, you can't really use full performance on the road um, without getting into serious trouble. So um, take take the car along to track days, and uh, and that, that's fabulous. You know, you can really let the car open up, really explore the handling. the most fabulous adrenaline rushes uh, experience you know it's a roller coaster ride fabulous Lamborghini had shocked the world with the Mura you know first production mid-engine car and then the Countach came along and made, made the Mura look pretty old-fashioned and in fact made everything look old-fashioned and, and if you think back I mean there probably isn't any supercar that stood the test of time so well. The, the doors going up seem to attract more attention than the rest of the car to be honest. <laughs> in fact the car with the doors open takes on a whole other look which isn't really a gimmick you know it is it is quite practical in tight spaces getting out in my garage, which is a tight space, getting out of the car, it, it makes it e it's easy for access. The last Kuhnjash was produced in July 1990. This, this saw the end of a production span of some 17 years. Um, but during that period, many other fine models were actually made by Lamborghini. Generally in terms, they weren't supercars. Um, in the vein of the Countach. In September 1990, when the, when the Diablo was introduced, um, this was such a superb car. Um, it was now it had cars that were capable of 202 mile an hour with 0 to 60 speeds of, of four seconds. The car was so technically advanced and so fast, so superb. A stunning piece of design. This car is uh, the Diablo SE30, like the special edition for the 30th anniversary of Lamborghini factory. 150 only of those cars were made. They took the Diablo and lightened the car significantly by about 350, 360 pounds in weight. They uh, increased the power output of the engine to about 525 brake horsepower. They made other modifications to turn this into a sportier, uh, more responsive car, almost a track car. There's traction control, which is switchable. You can switch it in on three settings or you can switch it out. Traction control is basically allowing you to drive with the full power without spinning the wheels every five minutes. They've also put a roll bar adjustment in the cockpit, so you can alter the stiffness of the roll bars to set the car up differently. The Diablo, when introduced, was purportedly the fastest production car in the world. On the continent and the autobahns, of course, you can drive faster. And with Lamborghinis, yeah, we've driven close to the 200 mile an hour at times. The most fun, though, is had on the track with these cars, because although you don't reach the higher speeds, you certainly reach the maximum potential of the cars in handling and speed at the same time on a racetrack. In the late 80s and early 90s, selling supercars was serious business. And as a result, for the Diablo, they produced a spectacular prestige brochure, presented in such a way that when you were sitting in your armchair 
looking at a set of brochures for other supercars that might be considered the Diablo brochure would look more lavish and more expensive. By 1991, the recession had started to hit and a lot of the supercar manufacturers were already starting to feel the strains and the loss of sales. And um, if Lamborghini, I feel, weren't owned by Chrysler as they were at the time, and with the vast amounts of monetary resources made available to them, I'm certain they would have probably gone under. This car was made for the Sultan of Brunei's birthday. And it was commissioned as a birthday present, but typical maybe of Italy or Lamborghini. Um, they didn't make the car in time for the birthday, so he had to have another present. Consequently, he didn't get this birthday present. <laughs> front windows dive down at the front. Looks like a styling exercise, but it's a very useful exercise because when you're driving the car, you can see very clearly the edge of the road. It gives you a, an immediate view so you can place the car precisely on the corners. Nobody comes up to you and says, oh, this is a so-and-so. They usually come up and say, what does it cost? Uh, especially in UK. So I usually turn around and say to them, no, that's not the question you should ask. Ask me about the car. Ask me about the power. Ask me about the design. Ask me about the history. Don't ask me how much it costs you. <laughs> People will always want something faster, something more extravagant, something more expensive even. There's a joy in happy times in spending money. Um, but what they won't want is something ever wider, ever lower, ever noisier, and ever less practical. I think there'll be a reversion to first principles. And I think people, we may well find that supercars of the next few years are, are, are tiny and light and um, completely different in every respect except design, sophistication and cost. It's a monster of a car. Uh, real challenge to drive um, and I think that's the, the, the really nice thing about it. You know, even after having this car for a few years, you still get in and it's like getting in it for the first time. The excitement's still there, it's still a challenge and uh, you can't be lazy with your driving. You know, you've really got to get up and grab hold of this thing. And, uh, and go with it, because if you don't, it just takes you away. You know, it's like a wild horse. Lamborghini, almost through all the years of its existence, has struggled against the odds to, to build these cars and, and to sell them and remain viable. I'm sure Lamborghini will go on. And I still think that, in particular, this car is the ultimate sort of plaything. It's totally impractical. It's difficult. Uh, it's uh, difficult to drive. It's noisy. It's, it's rather fragile. But I think, as a, a, I could say a turn-on, but as a car to really make yourself feel all's well with the world on a Sunday morning, get into this, go for a long drive, and you'll feel much better. <laughs> <laughs>